Amen. Are you ready for God's word this Sunday morning? Are you ready for God's word this Sunday morning? Hallelujah. Let's rise up to our feet as we open our Bibles, the book of Romans. The book of Romans chapter 8, verse 18 to 22. This is our month of emergence, and we will emerge in the name of Jesus. Romans chapter 8, verse 18 to 22. Here begin after the reading of God's word. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. In the Amplified Translations, my focus being on the 19th verse, it says... For even the whole creation, all nature waits expectantly and longs earnestly for the sons of God to be made known, waits for the revealing and the disclosing of their sonship. The entirety of creation is waiting for something, waiting for someone waiting for some people. The whole creation is waiting for the unveiling, manifestation, revealing of the true sons of God. It says the whole of creation, meaning it's not just one sector, but every sector and every area is looking forward to this. The whole of creation is waiting for the emergence of the sons of God. The creation is waiting for you. Help me tell your neighbor the creation is waiting for you. Your emergence is an emergency. That's the simple subject of my meditation this Sunday morning. Mighty Father, I ask that you help me, enable me, speak through me. Let yokes be destroyed, let burdens be lifted. Let your will be done, let your kingdom come, let your counsel stand. Let revelation flow freely in this house, unhindered by any demonic force or power. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. And the people said aloud, amen. amen. And you may be seated as you say, your emergence is an emergency. <laughs> it's an emergency. The text that we just read in the verse 18, is said that the suffering of this present time is not worthy to be compared with what shall be revealed in us, with the glory that shall be revealed in us, the suffering of this present time. What you are going through right now is not worthy to be compared with the glory that will be revealed in us. Hmm. Not worthy. You can't put them in the same room. The glory that's about to be revealed, when you put it together with the suffering that you're going through right now, uh, that suffering has to exit the room. It's not worthy to be in the same space with the glory that's about to be revealed. Now, Paul says in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16 to 18, he says, Therefore we do not lose hope. Heart. Even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. Listen to verse 17. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Why we do not look at those things which are seen, but to the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are are eternal. Again, Paul is giving us the same principles, illustration, insight here, where he's saying that our affliction is both light and momentary. 
I don't know about you, but the affliction that I am facing and the challenges that I'm facing, I'm not sure I would characterize them as light and but for a moment. It would seem like my afflictions are, are quite heavy and that they have been around for a while. But the only reason that Paul would describe it as such is because he's describing it in comparison with something else. So that immediately you compare it with something else, what you used to call heavy and enduring, you have to reclassify and redefine it as light and but for a moment. He says that our light affliction is, is, is for a moment and it is working for us a far more exceeding weight of glory. It tells us that this process of this working out of the glory of God is facilitated by our, our keeping our gaze focused upon what is not seen over what is seen. So I am not going to keep on focusing on what is going wrong that I can see. I'm going to keep my eyes on the promise that I have not yet seen. Therefore, I call those things that be not as though they were. And, and this now gets us to start to see even more deeply what he's really trying to say is that this thing you are going through, it's actually working for you. It's a workout. It's working for you. It's a divine setup working for you for glory. No wonder Romans 8.28 says, and we know that all things work together for good for those that love God and are called according to to his purposes. I don't know what you are going through right now, but I came to remind you this Sunday morning that it's working together for good. It's working for you. It's preparing you for the glory that's about to be revealed in your life. The contradictions are working for you. It is a necessary contrast for the spotlight upon the glory of God in your life. This is what Isaiah chapter 60 meant when he says, Arise and shine for your light has come and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. Verse 2, For darkness shall cover the land and gross darkness shall cover the people, but the light of God will be seen upon you, and Gentiles will come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your writing, rising. It says that in the same time when there is darkness and gross darkness, it is at that same time that the glory and the light of God will be seen upon you. Is anybody hear me what I'm saying? Somebody shout amen. What he is therefore saying is that whatever you are going through now, in fact, whenever you see darkness and gross darkness, you should not panic. It's an indicator. It's a sign. It's a trigger that the glory of God is about to be revealed in your life. Somebody shout amen. Now, when you initially read Isaiah chapter 60 and verse 1 to 3, it's in, under the no old covenant, though prophetic of the new covenant. Uh, it, it seems to suggest that the light comes first before we arise. So many people are waiting to see light before they rise. Uh, but the New Testament says that the just shall live by faith. So we do not necessarily wait for the light, for we are the light. So so we arise in faith. Is anybody hearing what I'm saying? So Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 14 says, Therefore he saith, Awake you who sleep. Arise from the dead and Christ will give you light. Did you notice the sequence in the New Testament? It didn't say Christ will give you light, then arise and awake. He says, awake who you who sleep. Arise from the dead and then Christ will give you light. In other words, I need you to step out in faith first and then you're going to, the glory of God will meet you in that pathway. In other words, awake, arise and the light will follow. Moses parted the Red Sea with his staff upon the instructions of God Almighty and the Israelites crossed the Red Sea on dry ground. That was a testament of the old covenant. But in the new covenant, uh, Joshua, who is a type of Jesus, did not stretch out a staff. Rather, God instructed, step into the waters. 
And as he stepped into the waters of the Jordan, only then did the waters pass. And that's the instruction now. You've got to be willing to step in in faith. Step into that job in faith. Step into that arena in faith. Step into that place in faith. And it is when you step in in faith, when you walk by faith and not by sight, that the waters will pass. Can I prophesy to somebody that the waters are passing for you, uh, even in this season and even in this day, in the mighty name of Jesus, the trees of the feet field will clap their hands. Uh, the mountains will skip at your entrance. Uh, if you believe me what I'm saying, come and shout amen. amen. We have to step in in faith. Now Romans chapter 13 verse 11 to 14 says, and do this, knowing the time that it is, knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now our salvation is nearer than when we first believe, believed. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Therefore let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lost, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lust. Now, listen brethren, now our salvation is closer than when we first believed. Now it is high time to awake out of sleep and put on the armor of, of, of light and put on the Lord Jesus. It's time to arise and shine. Did you hear me what I said? I said it's time to arise and shine. This is not the time to cower in darkness, in timidity or in fear. For God has not given Giving you a spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and of a sound time. It's time to arise and shine. For multiple years, we preached and taught a theology that made the rapture this great escape that we all look forward to. And I look forward to the rapture, but I found that that is inaccurate to see the rapture as a great escape, as a means of getting out of this world. That devil is a liar. Our assignment, listen to me, is not to escape, but to occupy to dominate. In the beginning, God created man, and he said, let us make man in our own image and in our own likeness, and let them have dominion. So we see that God's original intent for mankind was that man would walk in dominion. God hasn't changed his mind. God's plan for man is still that you and I will walk in dominion. In the book of Matthew and chapter 24, when the disciples asked Jesus about the latter days and what would be the sign of his coming, Jesus gave them various pictures of the various things that would happen in that day. And we are already seeing those things happening all around us. But he said, even at that time, it is, the end is not yet. These are only the beginning of sorrows. These are only the beginning of the end. But then, that's not my focus this Sunday morning. We now see the, the, the next set of parables that Jesus tells his disciples immediately after telling them about the last times. The next set of parables were all about uh, uh, fulfilling your time. It was all about occupying. It, it, we read the parable of the faithful servant and the evil servant, both of which were given uh, assignments uh, to do. Uh, and the, 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 the faithful servant did the assignment and was rewarded, while the evil servant says, my Lord delays in his coming and didn't do the assignments that were given to him. Then we read the parable of the wise and the foolish virgins uh, who were waiting for the bridegroom to come and the wise virgins had oil prepared extra for to be able to receive him when he arrived while the foolish did not have any oil in store so when the time came they ran out of oil and they now needed to look uh, for, for oil elsewhere they begged the 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 wise virgins that please give us oil. The wise virgin says, oh, sorry, we can't give you any of our oil. Why don't you go uh, to those that sell and buy? 
sell and buy. So they, they had done what was necessary at the right time, so they had enough oil to be able to meet the bridegroom. All of this speaking about occupying. Then we read of the parable of the talents, where the master gave his, his servants, three of them, he gave one five, another one two, and another one one. Now listen to what he said. He said that he gave them according to their ability. Now that's why we don't compare ourselves with ourselves. There is none without a talent, but he will give you the talent that you can handle, the talent that you have the capacity to carry. So he gave everybody their talents, and he went on a long journey, and when he returned, he came to see what they had done with what he had given them. You see, God gives you something. What you do with what he has given you is your gift back to God. <laughs> Hallelujah. So now we find that, that the person with five multiplied his own, and he was, he was called good and faithful servant. The person with two multiplied his own, called good and faithful servant. The person with one, uh, uh, maybe because he was comparing himself with others, or whatever psychology was going on on the inside of him, had hidden his own and not used his own. And therefore, he was reprimanded. He was judged for not doing so. And even the little that he had was taken away from him, from him and given to him that had more. Oh my goodness, it seems not fair. But the truth is, what you don't use, you will lose. And it is only that which you maximize that attracts more to be added unto you. Somebody say amen. A parallel to this same parable we read in the book of Luke chapter 19 verse 21 to 27 and this is the parable of the minas where 10 servants were now called and all of them were given 10 minas which is money and the instruction that was given by the Lord in that text was occupy till I come. Occupy till I come. The new King James translation renders it this way. It says, do business till I come. Our assignment to the return of the Lord is not one of escape artists looking for how to get out of the world, but one of profitable servants seeking to occupy, to multiply, and to fill the space. He's not returning for a broke, busted, and disgusted church. He's coming for a triumphant church without spot wrinkle or any such thing. This is our mandate. It's not how am I going to get out, it's how am I going to fulfill the word occupy is a very interesting word. It's a verb that means to fill or to take up a space or time, to be situated in or at a place or position in a system or hierarchy, to hold a position or job, to fill or preoccupy the mind or thoughts, to keep someone busy and active, to take control of a place, especially a country, by military conquest or settlement, to enter, to take control of, and stay in a building, often forcibly. Synonyms for occupy include live in, inhabit, be tenant, lodge in, be established in, take up residence in, settle in, populate, take up, fill up, cover, extend over, hold. Hold, be in hold, be, be, in, be in, hold down, engage, capture, take possession, colonize, garrison, dominate, subjugate, and I could go on. It is from that word that we get the word occupation, and an occupation is what you do for a living. <laughs> It is also from that word that we get the word, the occupying force, or the phrase, an occupying force, who has entered a land and has occupied that land and has taken control in that land. So when the Lord says, occupy till I come, this is not an idle instruction. This is an active mandate. Occupy till I come. Occupy, do business, do transactions. Jesus himself said, I have to be about my father's business. He's literally telling us to go into the world and dominate the world. Whew. This is a theology, a challenge in this day that a lot of people are still struggling with somewhat. The world is literally waiting for us to occupy our rightful positions. Hallelujah. Amen and amen. Now, in the book of Haggai chapter 2, from verse 5 to 9, it says, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, yet once in a little while I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land. 
I will shake all nations. Isn't that what's happening right now? All nations are shaken. And the desire of all nations shall come. What is the desire of all nations? What is the desire of all nations? The desire of all nations is peace and prosperity. Every nation, ultimately, what do they want? Peace and prosperity. That there will be peace and prosperity, that everybody will be thriving, that everybody will be good. That's what everybody desires. The desire of all nations, essentially, is heaven on earth. The desire of all nations that they are unaware of is Christ Jesus. For he is the career of heaven on earth. Christ Jesus is the Son of God. And now are we the sons of God. The desire of all nations is manifesting sons of God. It's sons of God emerging and rightful occupying the positions they're supposed to occupy. The world is literally waiting for us to emerge. Isaiah chapter 2, verse 1 to 4, a lot of debate around the, the, this scripture um, but it's, it's a powerful scripture. And parallel to this scripture, or the same prophecy is given in Micah chapter 4, verse 1 downwards. Now listen to what Isaiah chapter 2, verse 1 to 4 says. It says, the word, with the word that Isaiah, the son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. And it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow unto it. And many people shall go and say, come ye, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us his ways and we will walk in his path. For paths, for out of Zion will go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem, and he shall judge among the nations and shall rebuke many people, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hawks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. Now, certain theologians would argue and say that this prophecy was specific to Judah and Jerusalem and to specific to a particular time. And I will agree with them, but I would say that they are limiting it because I have found out that the word of God and the, the, the prophecies of God's word can have multiple layers of meaning. And though this prophecy is specifically applicable to Judah and Jerusalem, as the first verse said, it is still uh, uh, applicable to the day we are living in and to spiritual Israel. Is anybody hearing me what I'm saying? So this prophecy is actually not just talking about then, but talking about now and also talking about the future. Mm -hmm. And when you read the latter part of that prophecy, when it says that there will be no more war, nation will not be rising against nation and so on and so forth, obviously this is talking beyond Judah and natural Judah and Israel. It's talking about the spiritual Israel and the ultimate end. This prophecy is therefore still applicable today. And it says that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on top of all the other mountains. The mountains of the Lord's house. Now, you know, when you think about that, again, those that want to, to interpret it literally, which is not inaccurate, think about the mountain of the temple in Jerusalem. But when you look at this spiritually, you find out that the Lord's house has never really been about a location as much as it has been about a people. It's been about a people. So that Jesus was talking to that woman at the well and they were talking about worship. worship. And, and, and Jesus says to her, you think that to worship is in this location or in that location, but God is not about looking for location. He has not made his dwelling in actual physical buildings, but in the hearts of men and women. He's looking for worshippers who will worship him in spirit and in truth. The Lord's house is more about the people than the house. 
The people are the house. This is the house that is being built up lively stones. And it says that the mountain of the Lord's house, God's people, will be exalted above the top of the mountains in the last days. God's people, can I prophesy to somebody? God's people are going to be elevated in this day. They are going to occupy positions of great influence and great power for the kingdom of God. Are you one? of such people that God is going to use if you believe it. Come and shout, Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Now, he says that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be elevated above all the other mountains. Now, what are these other mountains? It is largely believed and agreed amongst a whole lot of the charismatic church movement that there are seven mountains that this can refer to. Seven mountains of living culture, living society. And these mountains include media, arts and culture, um, education, uh, business, family, uh, religion, and government. These are four mountains of society, 12, seven mountains of society. And he's saying that the mountain of the Lord's house, God's people, who are really the Lord's house, shall be elevated above the other mountains. This is telling us, actually, that we are meant to infiltrate these other mountains and fulfill the dominion mandate there. Now, there has to be an accurate, and a time for to be an accurate teaching of what the dominion mandate is, because some people take it to extremes that it's not meant to go to. But at very least, we are meant to be salt and light in every mountain. We have to have a paradigm shift in our thinking where we realize that the church is not meant to be relegated into some corner somewhere and irrelevant in the world, that the assignment of the church is actually in the world. Whoo, hallelujah. Whatever mountain you find yourself, God has sent you there to be salt and to be light, to be his missionary in that place. <laughs> Mark chapter 16 and verse 15, the great commission. And God said unto them, go ye into all the world. Mark 16, 15. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Now, earlier on, we believed, not wrongly, that this meant go from door to door, knocking on doors, asking people whether they know Jesus, and when they say they don't, share the gospel with them. Go out fishing. Yeah? Nothing wrong with that. Great practice. We should still do it. But when we look deeply to that verse, it was more than door-to-door -door evangelism. It said, go ye into all the world. It didn't say, go ye into all the earth. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. The earth is terra firma. The earth is the physical earth. Go ye into all the, no, not earth, world. World is different. World is cosmos. And cosmos is the systems and the structures of men. And Jesus says, go ye into all the world. He's telling you to go into all the structures, the systems of men, to display, to preach, to show forth the gospel of Christ, oh, of Christ Jesus. Do you hear me, what I'm saying? Go ye into all, go into media, go into arts and entertainment, go into government, uh, go into education, go into family, go into religion, and influence it for the kingdom. Now, where the debate arises is that are you there to take it over? Are you there to just influence till Jesus comes? Well, that we can continue debating that from morning to night, but one thing that I do know is that occupy till I come. So whatever space he assigned me to, my job in that space is to occupy, to be his ambassador. You see, to be salt in the steel, light in the darkness. Hallelujah. Go ye into all the world. The world is waiting as I round up and come back to our pilot text. 
The whole of creation is waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God, the emergence of the sons of God. The world, listen, it says the whole of creation, all of creation is waiting. That means it's not just men and women that are waiting. Can I, can I say that even, even the, the ecosystems of the world, even nature itself is waiting for the emergence of the sons of God? Can I suggest to you that the sons of God are the ones that have the answer for how to manage the resources of the earth, how to deal with, uh, with nature and ecosystems and oil and gas and uh, renewable energies and all of these things. The world is waiting. The world has tried its best and has still fallen short and is in disarray. The world is waiting for the emergence of of the sons of God. Oh, I don't know what you're, whether you hear me what I'm saying. The health sector is waiting for sons and daughters of God that will arise with solutions and answers. Oh yes, the education system, the world has tried its best and is confused. Uh, right is left, left is right, up is down, down is up, is waiting for men and women of sons of God to arise and show the true path and show how it is meant to be. The world is waiting for the emergence of the sons of God. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it is now an emergency. Somebody shout, yes, it's an emergency. The world is in trouble and it's an emergency looking for sons and daughters of God that will emerge with the answer. The other day I was on the road and I heard the siren start to blow behind me and then I saw lights flashing in a car, an emergency vehicle and all of us that were on the road, we moved. We moved to the side, some to the rest, some to the right, all to allow this emergency vehicle to pass us by and go to wherever there was a call. Can I prophesy and announce to somebody the world is in trouble and now heaven is waiting for you and waiting for me to put on our light and sound the alarm. Put on our sirens and arise and shine. And once you do that, my God will make sure that the road clears for you. Ah, all the traffic that was blocking you before is going to open its way and let you through because you are the son of God with the answer for the emergency. Uh, emergency. Your emergence is an emergency. It's time for our emergence. There's a crisis. It's an urgent situation. Extremity, exigency. It's dangerous. But guess what? God's got us. This is the state that the world is in now and it's waiting, yearning and looking for the emergence of the sons of God. Can I tell you something? You don't just have the answer. You are the answer. Did you hear me what I'm saying? You don't just have the answer, you are the answer. Oh my goodness, you are the answer. Sometimes you're going to step into the space. You haven't just, you haven't even said anything, but because you carry the very atmosphere of heaven, because God is with you, your very presence causes peace and calm. All of a sudden they are just calm that, oh, he's come in. We're going to have a solution. He's come in. He's going to tell us what to do. He's come in. He's going to get us out of this pickle. I'm talking about you. I'm talking about you. I'm talking about you. If you believe me what I'm saying, Come on, shout, yeah! Your emergence is an emergency. Uh, you've been sitting by the sidelines for too long. It's now time to come in and occupy center stage by the favor of the might and the anointing of God. Come on, somebody go ahead and give God the glory. You don't just have the answer. You are the answer in your family. You are the answer. In your job, you are the answer. 
in that field, you are the answer. For your children, you are the answer. In whatever sector, you are the answer. In arts and entertainment, you are the answer. In media, you are the answer. In government, you are the answer. I don't know what sector it is that God has called you to do, to be. But whatever sector it is, you are the answer. The world has been waiting for your emergence. It's time to arise and shine. It's time to occupy. 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 Occupy the finished work of Christ Jesus. He's already paid the price. He's already done it all. Your job is occupying it. You must have that attitude, that, that, that crazy confidence that it's already done. My job is to occupy. Do you realize when we even talk about spiritual warfare, go to the book of Ephesians in chapter 6, when it says that, talks about we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, and the rulers of darkness and spiritual wickedness in heavenly places. It says, having done all to stand, stand therefore. The word stand there is actually akin to the word occupy. It's the, the, the Greek word that's translated stand and withstand is histamine and antihistamine. Now, medical persons know what histamines and antihistamines are. These are chemicals that go and occupy receptor sites to, cur to, to block certain other reactions because the space has already been occupied. You see, it is only possible for those reactions to take place when the receptor sites, the spaces, have not been occupied, so it can trigger a reaction you don't want to see. But if something else has already gone in and occupied the space, then there's no space for the negative to come and trigger a reaction that you do not want to see. So what Jesus is saying, I have won the battle. You are more than a conqueror. I'm the victor. I won it for you. I gave you the victory. Your job is to tend and keep. Your job is to occupy what I have already won for you. Occupy it. Don't give space for something else to take this. I think the problem with us as believers is that we have often evacuated spaces and allowed the enemy to take the space. A space we are meant to, we evacuated media because we didn't like certain things that were happening in the media. And what you did is you gave, gave, Call Blanche to the world to do whatever he wanted to do with media. You, you evacuated government. Oh, they are all, all politicians are evil. They are all corrupt. They are all bad. So we, we, we stepped out of it. And then we allowed the enemy to occupy. Oh, that devil is a liar. Education. Instead of occupying, we, we step back. That, oh, it's too much work. Oh, no. God should just bless me. No, no, no. And, and then, unfortunately, our theology of escapism, by always talking about how we're going to get out of the world, never allowed us to develop a heart of responsibility to showcase Christ clearly. So that when Christ comes, we are the triumphant, glorious church that is simply taken out of the world. Amen. And even when he takes us out of the world, guess what? He's taking us out only for a time to bring us back in. Because there shall be a new heaven and a new earth. Sorry to bust some people's bubble. Heaven is not your ultimate destination. It's still here. In a new heaven and a new earth. Father, we give you the glory. We give you the praise. There's no God like unto you. Your emergence is an emergency and the world is waiting on you some of you you have to emerge in the place of prayer now knowing your strategic position even in your family even in your field some of the work you need to do is in the place of prayer place of prayer father we give you the glory we give you the praise who, hallelujah to your name. Glory, Lord Jesus. Glory, Lord Jesus. There is no safety outside of Christ. And I'm talking beyond the temporal safety of walking upon the earth. I'm talking about the 
eternal security. None, none outside of Christ. You have to be in Christ. So if you're out there and you haven't accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, or you know you've backslidden and you want to come back into him today, please, this is your moment. Do not neglect, neglect so great a day of salvation. If you're ready to surrender your life, please repeat these words of prayer after me. Lord Jesus, thank you for the price that you paid. Thank you for giving your life for me. Today, I repent of my sin. I believe with my heart. I confess with my mouth that you are my Lord and my Savior. By faith right now, I am born again. A new creation. In Christ Jesus. Amen and amen. If you pray that prayer, indeed you are saved. You are my brother, you are my sister. And we celebrate your entry into the kingdom of God. Translated out of darkness into glorious light. We want to help you to grow in the Lord. So please connect with us on any of our platforms. Direct message us. Go to our website or use the contact details that are available on the screen. And let's get beside you to help you to go. Particularly imperative in these days and times is to make sure that you are planted in the house of the Lord. So you flourish in the courts so that you can get the instructions, the prophecy, the insight, the illumination that you need to know how to walk with God in these challenging times in the indeed. So please connect with us and let's help you to do that. Hallelujah, hallelujah. If this is your first time worshiping with us in House on the Rock, whether online or in person in the hall, we are so elated that you decided to join us. You also, please get in touch with us. Send us a message. Let us know that this was your first time so that we can uh, get to know you a lot better and also help you to be integrated into the family of God. 